Okay, all the essential ingredients have arrived. <laughs> so um, we have our interviewee, our translator, and our participant. So I want to welcome everybody on today's interview. We're interviewing Chitahari Das, who many of you I'm sure have know about. He's one of the been a long time um, disciple of Guru Maharaj. Um, I'm going to read his bio to start and then we'll launch into the interview. So Chidahari was born as Christopher Brown in, in 1970 in rural Massachusetts. Chitahari Das spent the first 25 years of his life as a visual artist, avid reader, writer, and lover of nature. His natural introversion and sometimes even shyness made it difficult to relate to the noise and pace of modern society. He preferred the natural sights, sounds, and scents of the white pine forests surrounding his home to the jarring experience of urban environments. This nature and mode of processing life would undergird him and lead to his adoption of a monasticism in his mid twenties and continues to this day where he feels at home in nature and goes to town only when necessary. From an early age, his primary concern was philosophical. He wanted to understand the larger picture of life and was not content to pursue the standard Western course of material acquisition if it meant ignoring deeper questions. After a long period of searching for answers to those questions, he found his lifelong mentor, Swami B. V. Tripurari in Eugene, Oregon in 1996, and was initiated by him into Sri Chaitanya's Nam Dharma in mid-July of that year. So given his background in construction, he has been extensively involved in the development <clears throat> of his Guru Dave's ashrams, Adarya, Sagrahi, and to a lesser extent, Madhavan. In the realm of woodworking, he likes to make simple shaker and arts and crafts inspired furniture and cabinetry. His other services while in the ashram included forestry, cooking, which in the beginning was a stretch, but now it's one of his favorite activities. Save a puja of his various deities, Gornitai, Narasringa, Shalagram, and especially Govardhan Shila. Proofreading of Swami's books and writing articles of his own on Gaudiya Vaishnavism. <clears throat> While at Sargra, he was, he was heavily engaged in a market garden another big stretch considering the non-greenness of his thumbs. And while still not a gardener by nature, greatly appreciates the art. So after three attempts at relationships, which didn't work out very well for various reasons, he made his way back to Philo, California, where he currently lives with Brahma Das and Leela Dasi at their inn and works during the week at Adarya doing, as one might expect, carpentry, maintenance, and forestry. So it's a little <clears throat> picture of what's been going on in Chivahari's life, and we will unpack some of this in the next hour or so. So um, again, we are looking at, <clears throat> looking at the Sadika's journey, and we're correlating it loosely somewhat to the, um, to the, um, I don't know, I'm just like totally blanking on it, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. That's how loosely we're correlating it these days. <laughs> um, so yeah, the different stages of what a hero goes through and how the sadhakas, every sadhaka goes through those um, different stages and different ways at different times. So, I wanted to just kind of launch into the first question that I usually ask is, and you did bring this out in your, your bio somewhat, uh, 
any to you really um, significant things that may have given you some hints or clues growing up that you were bound for this for a spiritual um, philosophical journey rather than the just ordinary life of materialist. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, um, I started drawing when I was like five and I like to read and, you know, there's the typical introverted activities. Um, and um, I, I, I kind of shied away from the, a lot of things that kids like to do, like the noisy kind of things, like going to amusement parks and stuff would just leave me exhausted and whatnot. Um, and I, I remember being able to, I liked as a young young boy to be able to sit with the adults and, and take part in their conversations and was even able to do so and keep up with them in a lot of ways, which sometimes they would even comment like, how do you do that? Just the more adult themes of what attracted my mind rather than, you know, and sure, I watched a lot of cartoons. I did all that kid stuff too. Somehow, I'm thinking, you know, you're, you're kind of, Chidahari, I'm just going to interrupt. I, yeah. I think maybe everyone is going to need to turn off their um, cameras because we have some really low bandwidth coming on Chidah's mm -hmm. end. So, see if that helps. Okay, okay. so go ahead. Um, yeah, I remember one instance I was, um, my cousin was, he was much older. Um, he was in the process of building a house and my dad and I were helping him clear his land and, and they were just sitting talking about something I forget. And at one point, my cousin just was like, you're wise beyond your years. And I was like 11. Anyhow, so I always, like I mentioned in the bio, I always had this kind of desire to understand the bigger picture of life like what is it all about what's going on here what you know just what is this life um but that was um it didn't it didn't really start to uh, percolate in a more meaningful direction until my last year in high school where i started reading eastern philosophy and um i even uh, I had one English teacher who was a really cool guy. Uh, he uh, had created this class he called Futuristics. And in it, his overall, his overarching, I think, uh, goal was to try to get these young, you know, know-it-all high school kids to look at life from a different perspectives. And he was successful in doing that. And um, in, in some instances, some people just took it as an elective and criticized them the whole time. Um, but I, I found him to be inspiring. And um, one day he um, asked us, asked if any of us wanted to learn meditation. And um, I mean, he was the kind of guy, he, would, he brought in a, a biofeedback machine and hooked somebody up to it to see like, okay, if you can actually change your brain waves, it was far out. Um, so anyhow, he asked one day if people wanted to learn some yoga, hatha yoga, asanas and meditation. And so I stayed after school and did that and then started a, a practice of Hatha yoga at that point, which I continued on off and on for years, many years. Wow. Um, and uh, it wasn't in high school, of course, you know, I, I straight out of high school, I joined the Navy and that didn't work, um, luckily. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that would have changed my life trajectory quite a bit, I think. But um, when I got back, uh, I, um, well, I started hanging out with some friends, one of whom was um, pretty heavily involved in the psychedelic scene and well, not the scene, but taking them. <laughs> and so I started doing that. And that was also part of uh, my search for meaning, you know, and confronting the shadow aspects of oneself uh, in a, in a very, um, what's the word suggestive, I guess, mind state or a very open mind state, you know, delving into these things that would come up and somehow managing to not go crazy or, you know, shy away from the things that we saw, you know, mm -hmm. and come out the other side as relatively functional people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and 
that went on for a number of years. And then, and then I was still practicing Hatha yoga and working odd jobs and whatnot. And at a certain point, uh, a high school friend of mine, I had visited him, he gave me a couple of books, one of which was uh, Shivananda's Companion to Yoga. And another was Prabhupada's Paperback Gita. And at that time, the yoga I really took to, I had a strong sung scarf for that, but the Gita I was not into. And I was like, who's this guy think he is telling me to bow down to him, you know? So I mm. threw the book away Wow. and, uh, and continued to practice, you know, the, the Hatha yoga and whatnot. And, and some years went by and at a certain point in I probably around 93, I guess it was 23, 20, 22, 23. Um, I just had this very strong desire to just dedicate my life in service to humanity. And so I looked in the back of the Shivan on the book and looked up the closest center. It was in upstate New York. And then I had a friend drive me there and I moved in and took a teacher's training course there. And that was in the fall, October, September, October. Stayed there for mm, until mid winter. And then went home and then the following, uh, maybe, I don't know, a year later or so, went on a road trip with some friends. And so I guess I should unpack that a little bit more. And the time at Shivananda was pretty interesting because it was the first full immersion in ashram life and mm -hmm. Indian culture and yoga and mantra and all this stuff. I mean, the, the Hatha yoga aspect, I was quite adept at at the time. Um, so that was no, <laughs> I was gonna say no big stretch for me, but even though we were stretching, um, I did well on the teacher's training course and everything, but when it came to like, there were certain aspects of the, of the, uh, the more cultural aspects that didn't really, you know, I didn't really care too much about, but, um, can you be of, more specific Chitta, about what those were that, um, well, okay. I'll give an example of one night we uh, on Shivaratri, we observed Shivaratri because in Shivananda, that's like, that's their Janmashtami, right? So, mm. um, so we stayed up all night and, um, you know, chanting Om Namah Shivaya and whatnot. And then the next morning you break the you know, you fast and then you break the fast with a feast. And they had had one of their Indian congregants there cook the feast. And it was like this huge, you know, deep fried Indian feast. <laughs> You know, so it was really intense. Um, and just um, after a while, uh, after a few months of being there, I just needed to, uh, I, I remember I spent some time in New York City with uh, a couple of people who had been coming up to the, this is, so they had a, and they still do as far as I know, they have a, a center in Manhattan, Midtown, mm. and also the ashram in upstate New York. And so I was staying at the ashram and then at a certain point I needed to just take a break because it was just like the whole, all the cultural aspects and all the rules and all that. I was very much not used to any of that. So mm. um, it got a bit overwhelming. The culture shock kind of finally hit after a while and I was like, mm. okay, stepped back from it. But then I, you know, I went back and, um, but after a while it's like, um, so my orientation to the, to spirituality at the time was very much Brahma Sayujya. Mm. Um, you know, all the philosophy that I had read, of course, was written from uh, Neo Advaitin perspective. Because um, in high school, the people that I was reading were like Ram Das and Alan Watts and some mm. Zen Buddhists like uh, Suzuki, Shunryu Suzuki. And so I was reading all these different you know, Easterners and would, but it was like, you know, trending toward Advaita Vedanta or Buddhism. And so that was still my orientation. And then uh, I found out about Bhakti, you know, as a, as a standalone path, that was only much later. So at one point at Shivananda, well, I really liked working with mantra, like, and I started chanting Om Namo Narayanaya. Um, regularly and um even had an interesting experience at one point so they they had a they have a morning and evening satsangs and 
example and the first the the basic uh flow of it is like you come in you sit down do a silent meditation for half an hour and then after that there's uh they do kirtan and then after that there's some sort of discourse on whatever shastra they're talking from and during one of the meditations um i was chanting this mantra and i had this flash of the paramatma vishnu you know his arms were moving he had all the weapons and stuff and i was i came out of my meditation just kind of like well okay that was interesting i did not expect that um so did that change your trajectory at that no, time? Or? No, it wasn't that. No, what changed my trajectory was Krishna book. <laughs> mm. um, so they had a little room in, in the temple building complex where they had a library. And of course, me being the bookish kind of person that I am, I spent a lot of time there. And, uh, and, as that, and at that stage, I was still in the eclectic sampling kind of stage of spirituality where I was just reading different things and seeing how they hit me and I had all these existential questions kind of percolating in my mind that I hadn't yet to find answers to and uh, at one point uh, way up on the shelf there was this you know silver book with these big red letters Krishna and I was like what is that so I pulled it down and uh was immediately drawn to the art it was so beautiful you know i was like this is you know really attractive and uh, at one point i was sitting in a sitting i forget in a kind of a more public space and the the director of the place walked by uh his name was shrini basan i asked him so what do you think of these folks you know just what's your opinion and he dismissed them dismissed the devotees out of hand he's like oh pff, they're fanatics they think bhakti is the only way which is really interesting because if you think about it, the uh, Advaita Vedanta or, or Neo Advaitins like Shivananda, um, they, while they, they, they claim, they make the claim that their path is all accommodating because you can do anything and then attain Brahman. But from our perspective, it's just the opposite. They're the least accommodating. They're taking all of the possibilities of transcendence, which are infinite, and reducing them to a single one, right? Whereas we say transcendence is a really, really big place. And depending on how you want to relate to the absolute, you can do that. It's fine. And it's not just, so if you want Brahma Suja, yes, you can do that. And there's a the whole range of the theistic opportunities as well, rather than just saying that no matter how you approach this is what you'll end up in. That, you know, it's it's a contradiction that I think they haven't thought out that well, but anyhow. Interesting. Yeah, well, it's just interesting that that was, Guru Maharaj also was the Krishna book with when he went to stay in a coconut grove and he was with a bunch of quasi-spiritual people and they had a Krishna book and he, he pulled it off the shelf and he said, oh yeah, that, that's for you. <laughs> they said, that book's for you. He knew he was a little different. <laughs> so yeah, so that's interesting that you both Well, it wasn't that. so much the story at that, that time. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, at the time, it wasn't so much the stories. In fact, I can actually remember the day I had the book in my room and I was looking at the pictures and there's this one picture of Krishna when the... Um, Krishna and Mathura, when the flower, the garland maker has given these garlands and he's standing there and he's just looking so beautiful, mm -hmm. right? And I thought, wow. And so a little, to back up a little bit. So one of the, one of the long time members, this woman who had been there for 20 years, I was kind of wondering, well, what, you know, which deity should I worship or which mantra should I chant and whatnot? And I said, I'm kind of drawn to Krishna. And she said, well, when you think about Krishna, do you cry? And I was like, no. <laughs> and she said oh then you should worship shiva you know i'm like okay and anyhow so months later when i was i'm sitting i was just looking at this this picture of krishna and just and i thought wow i really you know he's just so beautiful so attractive i wish i could you know i don't know remember the exact thought i had but i remember there was like this shift in my heart as you could just feel it like and from then on, I was no longer comfortable there at that ashram. 
it wow. just didn't work for me. It was like from then on. In fact, I even there was a one point I got super sick. I thought I thought I might even die. I was like I couldn't get out of bed for like five days. It's like what, wow. I didn't know what happened. Still don't. You know, it's just super like vertigo and anyway. Um, so yeah, it was shortly after that I I made plans to leave, and then it wasn't until well, so I went home and back to my dad's place and. Um, you know, was working landscaping and whatnot and um, still trying to practice Hatha Yoga, even though, you know, the demands of the job were so physical, I didn't really have much energy for it. And then maybe a year or half a year went by, I forget exactly. And then I went to some friends of mine who I grew up with. He had, he had moved to Kansas. Uh, anyway, long story. So I ended up going on a road trip to Kansas with him. And then, and then in the spring, we went to the west coast and we had none, none of us had ever been there well, one of us one of our friends in our group had been to oregon and praised its glories and we were like okay well that seemed like a pretty cool destination or at least something to check out along the way and the road the intent of the road trip was to find a piece of land that we could develop our own community on and mm. become self-sufficient didn't exactly work out that way um <laughs> because when we got to eugene oregon the Ramaj's people had a book table at the Saturday market that we would go to. And this was in the spring of 96, April. And um, and so there was a kind of a, a convergence of events that really that that term at that point. So I had been um, at Shivananda, I, of course, I was exposed to the Maha Mantra, and, but I really was more working with like Om. I had brass singing bowls, and I would, you know, Om to the bowls and whatnot, and, and that was kind of like my japa. Um, but of course, I didn't have a theistic conception of it at that point, anyhow. But there, I think there was some purification going on because it was, you know, Chaitya Guru was leading me in the right direction. It's like go west, young man. Yeah, go west. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh, ended up in Eugene and, and of course, the first thing I did, I saw the devotees and first thing I did, they got a book table and I started looking at the books and I was like, oh yeah, I've seen this book before and I've seen like the Gita and I started talking to the devotees and whatnot and one of them, one Yuga Dharma, first one I met, I was telling him how I had some, some inclination toward Buddhism, whatnot, and he and his... Um, uh, how shall we say, uh, less than tactful manner said, did you know that Buddhism is spiritual suicide? And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And so he explained it a little bit and I was like, well, that doesn't sound very good. Anyhow, so at the same time, uh, so I was, uh, my friends and I were camped at Torwerliger Hot Springs, which is also known as Cougar Hot Springs, which is an hour outside of Eugene. And so we were camped there um, illegally for months. <laughs> um, and then we would go into town about once a week to get supplies and take showers and all that kind of thing, to do laundry. So one day while doing laundry, um, this van of girls pulls up beside, our, beside ours and turns out they were from Seattle. They had been all the way down to the Baja and they were on their way back and they wanted to go out to the Springs. And so we were like, well, we're camped there. Well, you can follow us down. Okay, so we ended up becoming friendly with them. And so I was sitting in their Dodge family wagon one day and they had a little crate of books. And so I was like, pulled out their crate and looking through it. And lo and behold, there's Prabhupada's paperback Gita. And so- It was the same one you threw away some years same, ago. <laughs> very same book. And and suddenly I was just like drawn to it, like, like a, you know, a moth to a light. And- hmm started flipping through it and reading it and one by one all these existential questions that had been kicking around in my mind for years some of them and some of them more recent but like one by one Prabhupada was just like answering them boom boom mm -hmm. they're just falling like you know like wheat to the blade it's like wow this is amazing and in my in my journey across the country I had been kind of wanting to find the mantra that I could surrender to and give myself to and completely 
And I didn't have full faith in the Maha Mantra yet, even though I had known about it. But then reading Prabhupada's Gita, because he hammered on that point again and again, the Maha Mantra. And finally, it was like it clicked. Like, oh, yeah, that's it. It actually is the Maha Mantra. Wow, okay. So I started chanting the Maha Mantra. And then when I went back to the book table, um, I bought a, a, a sandalwood mala and a big copy of the Gita and started chanting and whatnot. And uh, so I'm reading the Gita and I'm chanting. And, and eventually at one point, Vrindaranya was there on the book table one week. You know, so weeks were going by. So Vrindaranya was there at one point, And so I was there and asking them, you know, talking with them, hung out with them for probably an hour or so. And then she said, you should come to the temple. I was like, really, I can do that? She's like, yeah. So, okay. So then after they left, they packed up and then I stayed at the Saturday market. And then after the market ended, I walked from there over to the temple. They gave, they'd given me the address and I walked over and, um, I knocked on the door and nobody answered. And I thought that was a little weird. So I let myself in, the door was unlocked. I let myself in. I hear this kind of like, I heard cartels, which I didn't know what they were at the time, but I heard music and I kind of uh, I walked in and I set down my African drum by the door and turned around the corner and looked in and there was Guru Maharaj was, they were doing Tulsi Puja, Tulsi RT uh, at the end. You know, it was, so it was the end of the evening program. So he's, he was chanting and playing the Madanga and leading three or four brahmacharis around. They were circumambulating Tulsi. And I thought, wow, you know, they're worshiping a plant. That's cool. They've you know, got some, some earth-based worship going on here. That's good. I can relate to that. And then um, I ended up staying over, I think. And uh, the... The president of the temple at the time, his name, Guru Maharaj had given him the name Sevananda, but he was, he's your, your god brother, his name is Dharma Raj, the Canadian fellow. He was, um, he gave me a copy of some kirtan that they had recorded there in the temple and a, you know, a cassette tape and a copy of Guru Maharaj's rasa. And so, um, so I, you know, I was, I was living in that kind of barter culture and, uh, so at one point I had this big African ashiko and then this small uh, clay drum, it's called a dunbek, which I didn't really care for. And so I was walking back, I had hitched a ride back out to my camp and I was walking back to my camp and some guys were coming the other way. And um, I had been thinking, well, okay, so now I have this cassette tape, but I have no way to play it. <laughs> what am I going to do? So this guy coming the other way, he's got a headset on. I was like, hey, you want to trade this drum for that Walkman? He was like, sure. Wow. So now I was able to play the kirtan. So I remember one day I was I was at my camp and I was laying in my hammock and I was listening to this kirtan and it just was like, um, I was like, wow, this is where I need to be. I need to be with these people doing this. And then when I read Rasa, I read it in like one sitting, like, you know, a couple of hours, just like, and it blew my mind because the... Mm the sacred eroticism that I had hoped was real actually is. And, and he spelled it out, you know, and of course there was a, a healthy bashing of Mayavad in there as well. That kind of, you know, further uh, dismantled that edifice of impersonalism that I had going. And, you know, and, and at the same time, it, 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 um, it gave me that a glimpse into the possibility and transcendence of the kind of spirituality that I was hoping was possible that I had never heard about anywhere. And so I was like, all right, I'm sold. I am sold. So um, some other things happened. I mean, I went to Seattle for a couple of weeks and then I ended up going back to the temple. I was like, I got to move into the temple. So I just showed up there one day, I'm like, okay, here I am. I'm ready to move in. <laughs> So, well, my, actually my intent was to, I went back to my camp and then I visited the temple one day with the intent of doing some service for a couple of days or whatever, and then going back to my camp, and whatnot, like that. I actually didn't think I was going to just move in. And then Dwi Jamani, one of my god brothers who was, who had been talking to me over the month, over the months and whatnot. So this is probably, this is probably May or June now. No. Uh, July because as you'll find out uh, so 
um, I went to the temple in Dwijimani. He's like, oh, it's really nice to see you again, you know? And um, he said, so how long are you going to stay for? I was like, oh, I'll just stay for a day and you stay overnight or whatever. And then go back to my camp. He's like, oh, listen, in two days is going to be initiation to a fire sacrifice. And I was like, what's that? Sounds cool. He said, oh, you got to stay for it. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, even though in my mind, I'm thinking, oh man, getting up at four o'clock in the morning, one day is one thing, but for two or three days, is, that's rough. I was like, okay, anyway, what have I got to lose, really? Mm-hmm. So then Guru Maharaj at that time was giving Bhagavatam classes in the morning. And, um, you know, it was totally captivating. I was just like hanging on every word, just like, wow. And I remember at one point when I, I think maybe when I first met him, yeah, when I walked into the temple, I heard, I heard something in his voice and I thought, I don't know what this man has, but I want it, you know, mm-hmm. just like that. It was so compelling. And then to hear him speak uh, from the Shastra, from the Bhagavatam about Krishna so charmingly and compellingly, it was just like, uh, this, this is it. And so then the morning before the initiations, he asked her questions. He said, okay, so tomorrow we'll have, you know, he gives his class, then he explained, tomorrow we're going to have initiations and whatnot, and explained a little bit about the significance of that. And he asked for questions, and I so I raised my hand. I was like, uh, Swamiji, uh, what about me? And he kind of squinted a little and cocked his head and looked at me and went, if you're serious, then after class, shave your head, put on a dhoti and tilak and come see me. I said, okay. So Chandradaya, one of the one of the guys living in the temple at the time, took me downstairs after class and he got me shaved up and tilaked and dotied and Guru Maharaj was sitting in his rocking chair out on the lawn, which he do in the summers. And I went out and talked a little bit. And then he dismissed me without whether I was going to do it or not, whether I was going to be actually, you know, initiated. So then the entire night and the whole, you know, the whole evening, people were asking me, so what did he say? And I was like, he didn't say yes or no, I don't know. And so I'm in anxiety and it's building. And then the next morning comes and then the and there's all this bustling activity, getting things ready. And I count the number of spots and I knew who was getting initiated. And so it was like, there wasn't a seat for me set out. And I was like, and so I'm in really an anxiety now. And then finally he comes in, sits down. And so I poked up my hand again. I was like, uh, Swamiji, what about me? And again, he kind of looked at me. And he was like, all right, come on. Now, of course, he already had a name picked out because, you know, I think he was waiting to see if I was going to like, Oh, how serious were you yeah so i asked him again and he said okay get him a seat and i was like all right so there i am you know learning i'm sitting down and the, they explain how to do achaman right there you know and i'm like okay i'm sipping water and i'm doing this whole thing and the next thing i know you know um i'm initiated and everything and then as he's giving me the beads he said okay so he tells me my name and whatnot and he said don't disappoint me and i was like okay <laughs> try not to and so then, yeah, and then I, I was full time in the temple. And then um, I remember telling him, I, would, I said, I'd, I'll give you five years, you know, in the temple. I was just, just kind of like, I wasn't really thinking that I would leave in five years, but I just wanted to make that formal kind of commitment just to make sure, you know. Mm. Okay, great. And so there I was, and the saga began, you know, learning how to do. How to do bhakti early days it was trying to stay awake in class which you know was really hard sometimes <laughs> like, we'd get up super early you know, and coming from a culture where nobody does that it's like to get up at before six o'clock you're insane so suddenly getting up at like you know four o'clock every day was a big change um and then all the cultural elements you know yeah. the food is so different it was great but and just the deity worship and they're just radically radically different um, yeah it's so. a, it, it is it's a cultural it's a shock to the to to our sensibilities and um it takes you know it takes some some months even years of being in that environment to finally kind of 
be able to sync with it in a way that feels natural. And I, I it was sure. really, yeah, yeah all those things were challenging for me as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so you landed, you landed in the ashram after some, you know, you explore it, you were exploring your spirituality through a different path, and then you were brought to um, bhakti, you took initiation, and now it seems like everything's perfect and great, right? <laughs> yeah, for the I first five years, you know. it was. Yeah. I mean, you know, there were struggles, and there was aspects of it, like, I couldn't really relate to the the um, evangelical aspect of it. I was like, what is this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, focus or so much emphasis on, you know, conversion and preaching and all that. It was just like, I didn't really relate to that, um, even though I was a like the <laughs> uh, Yeah, you so, kind of broke up know, a little bit, even really... though, yeah. What, what did you say? Can you repeat that, Shadahari? You kind of I couldn't really relate to couldn't relate to it, but even though I'm a product of it, so mm. I can't really complain too much. Okay. <laughs> like okay. if political tendency, then I wouldn't have met them on the street. So right. okay, got to give them that. Mm. But I guess my, and I still kind of think of it this way. Um, what I've noticed over the years is that the people who, a lot of times, the people who are the most disposed toward spreading the news as it were are the least qualified to really do so um mm, interesting, like for example, yeah. you know, the fellow that i met at first i mean he was he was really enthusiastic to go out there and sit on book tables and stuff but he was the last one that should have been preaching because he had a super fanatical take on that thing mm. so it's like you know his explanation was yeah but someone yeah. with more experience they can explain the tradition to people who were interested in it in a way that you know is much less confrontational and in consideration of their um of their minds doesn't really most definitely you know interesting but at the same time i guess you can, well for people who are ready um so I landed and yeah, but, uh, you know, there were, there were elements of it that, you know, I had never lived in a communal situation before. So that was difficult. You get interpersonal dynamics with people, a bunch of strangers that you would never have otherwise lived with. Suddenly you're thrust together and everybody's working on themselves and struggling with their senses and minds. And it, you know, it can get messy at times. Um, and you can lose sight of what you're all doing there together and become, it can become, a little bit adversarial, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know. Um, so how did you? How did you manage? The, how how did you manage that kind of situation when you would be, you know, in the ashram and there were people that maybe you just didn't feel very comfortable around, and there was you were yeah, not being able to communicate well with them. How did you deal with that as a ashramite? I think for the most part, I just let it lie and didn't give it a lot of attention. Like I'll give an example, there was one time that same person I'm talking about, um, he was really, he was the kind of guy who would go into the kirtan and pick a set of car towels and whack on them really hard every time. And one time I was just like, you know, you think you could maybe not play the biggest, loudest cartels all the time and maybe play them a little more gently. You know, I asked him really nicely and he said, well, maybe you shouldn't come to the kirtan. Then. And I was like, seriously, that's your answer. Whoa. It just, I could not relate to that. Like, you know, we're all here for the same reason here. Can we, you know, be a little accommodating, like the way you want to be. Is disturbing people and that's your answer that they should change okay you know so i just i didn't say anything i just was like all right, i tried to tolerate it, not stand too close to them during the kirtan so my ears would survive and you know 
eventually he was enough disturbance to enough people in the temple that Guru Maharaj asked him to leave. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I mean, he had a good service attitude, but it was like he could not live in a communal situation successfully. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I didn't, I was pretty, by nature, I'm just um, able to more or less get along with most people. And so I didn't have a lot of interpersonal conflict that I had to navigate. It was more, it was more just, um, struggling with myself and with the sadhana and whatnot. Mm. And then, you know, I would say, so, you know, philosophically speaking, we can uh, recognize that when you come to bhakti, and you're kind of riding on a wave of your samskar, right? It can seem very easy at first, right? Because you're you're not really traversing new ground, as it were. You're 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 mm -hmm. basically just picking up where you left off, and and then the way I I like to describe it is at a certain point, everybody hits the wall of their conditioning. Yes. And that's where you start actually. You pick up the hammer and chisel, and you start, you know chipping away the stone again on that wall. Yeah. Whereas, so then for the first four or five years, I, I was just like flying. I felt like, oh my God, I'm, you know, this is, I'm going back to God in this life. And then when I hit 30, suddenly it got really hard. And I was like, what's going on? Is, is that, what's happening here? And mm -hmm. it got harder and harder and harder. And um, then of course we, we, we had already, we had moved and whatnot and transitioned to California from Oregon. And, and, and uh, you know, of course, uh, so much happened in terms of the externals. We were building an ashram from the ground up on raw land, <laughs> which was massively exhausting and absorbing, but excellent and amazing at the same time. Um, you know, trying to, you know, do, do sadhana and, and, you know, learning the philosophy and worshiping the deity and learning how to can do all these, you know, Vaishnav things in the context of doing this huge project uh, was a very uh, intense period <laughs> for, for, for a very long time and for probably a decade and it was just nonstop. And of course, you know, when you live with someone of Guru Maharaj's caliber, he has had very high standards. And so, you know, if you're going to be around him full time, <laughs> uh, you're, you're in the hot seat, you know? Mm. And um, the, the, the work, the processing, psychological, emotional processing can become very deep. And, and of course the, you know, the ashram is a place really for very, very well adjusted people. And so if you're trying to adjust yourself, learning how to or learning how to become a well adjusted person in the context of that, that's a whole other layer that you've got to deal with. Uh, right. So yeah, I like I really really like how you described that, you know, in the beginning it may not be so difficult because we're kind of riding on our past some scars, our past um, eligibility and kind of coming back to where we left off and then and then you kind of hit a wall where you're you know you reach where you know come back to that point now the you know the work is really starting and in this life and yeah so for you it was about five years in that you were started to really feel that you were breaking new ground or you know trying to go through okay granite <laughs> some kind of really hard yeah. rock and um yeah yeah and there you were in a in a uh like you said raw land and a new project that i i can't even imagine you know and there was just a small group of you that were trying to make it all happen mm -hmm. and so yeah a lot yeah. of a lot of um a lot of opportunity for growth but a lot of opportunity also to get discouraged or feel um yeah it's like it was too much at times i'm sure 
Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, there was one, one, I mean, there's a couple of instances that stand out to me that really kind of illustrate what can happen in that situation. And there was, I'll describe one, um, there was a festival coming up, I forget which one. Um, it was a dry season, so it wasn't winter. It was probably springtime, I don't, I don't know what. And there was some, um, some devotees were visiting from Germany and whatnot. And, um, and I forget exactly what was going on, yeah. But anyhow, um, so the bathhouse, for some reason, I had had one of the whole, I had, had to dismantle the entire sink cabinet and rebuild it before this festival. And that was a sizable project. It was like gonna take a number of days. And, and <clears throat> as is often the case, um, there, there's a football coach named Vince Lombardi who said something that I think is a really good quote. He said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Mm -hmm. And so and now he was talking about that in, in context of football, but it's true mm -hmm. of life. Fatigue makes cowards of us all. In other words, when you're really tired, right? I mean, when yes. you're exhausted. Just don't have the strength to deal. Have, you don't have, yeah can't deal with stress very well. You can't deal with life very well. Right. Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that I've noticed in ashram life and is that there would be periods where you kind of get this perfect storm of, of circumstances that kind of come together and coalesce to just crush you. <laughs> mm. um, and I don't remember all the, you know, the different threads, but it's just like you get these amazing time pressures like this needs to get done and this needs to get done and they all need to get done at the same time and you're already tired it's just like your mind goes fuck i can't deal you know it's not you start to go on tilt a little bit and but despite all that you know you soldier on because that's what you do in the ashram right and some people are the well the ones who couldn't they they were the ones who were leaving notes on the pillow and stuff but um I, that wasn't my style. I just, I would, I would internalize it and I would get angry <laughs> and that would, that could come out. You know, sometimes I could get pretty ornery and, um, you know, confrontational and just be like, um, that was my stress coming out. That's how it manifested. I didn't have the emotional tools at that time to deal with them in a more mature fashion. Um, but in this one occasion, <laughs> so I'm, you know, deep into this project and it's just like i'm it's only a couple of days before there's going to be a bunch of people coming that need to use this bathroom on a daily basis and so i had to have this thing back together there was a hard hard deadline and so i'm working on this thing all day every day trying to get it back together and at the same time there, there was this wooden cabinet that guru Maharsh had bought to keep the, the song books and whatnot in in the temple room, which was, this is way before the temple was built. This is the temple room was still on the bottom floor of what is now his house. And so at one point he had asked me to stain this, this cabinet, which I did reluctantly because I was so busy. I didn't want to take time out from it. Right. And I, I even told him, I was like, you know, I don't really have time for anything right now. I need to really focus on this. So it'll be done before the guests get here. Anyway. So Either, either I stained it or someone else stained it, I forget. But in any case, he didn't like the color of it. And then he approached me to sand this cabinet, which would have taken a number of hours, which I literally did not have. And I just could not relate. I was like, why are you asking me to do this? You know, just leave the goddamn cabinet as it is. You know, I mean, I just couldn't see. I was like, I'm doing something that is really really important here and i can't take time to do that how is that not coming across you know and so that that was a super frustrating event for me it was just like oh, how you know how does this make any sense it just doesn't um but you know i weathered it and stayed and but there could be you know things things like that um and then um probably the 
the other hardest period or single hardest. Can I, can I interrupt right now? Because I think this sure. is really, I mean, it's a, I think a really important question that I would have is how, since you've, you know, lived with Gurmaraj for off and on for many, for many years and knowing what you know now about him and knowing about more about yourself, if you could relive that moment in time, mm -hmm. would you do, how would, how would you have dealt, how would you, would you deal with it differently, first of all? And if so, how would you deal with it now, as opposed to how you dealt with it then? Well, now I wouldn't get angry like I used to, you know, I would, I would, and I think I would have the, the where all now to say, you know, Guru Maharaj, I'm feeling really stressed about this. And if you want me to do this other thing, it very well might mean that I will not have this other very important thing done by the time the guests get here. I'll do it if you want me to, but understand that there will be consequences on the other end. So take your choice, you know. Um, I would present it like that now instead of getting ornery like I did in those days. Mm. Um, Excellent. Yeah, no, I think that's really important to uh, showcase. With yeah, the, with maturity, how we see that actually. Yeah, they're, you know, they're, yeah, no, it's just thank you for sharing that. So I didn't, so go ahead. I didn't mean to lose help. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, the other, the other time that I can remember was really, really, really difficult was um, at one point. I was the, it was a winter and winters at Audaria, if you've never lived there, they can be pretty rustier because it's just pouring rain. You know, living in a yurt in the pouring rain in the winter at Audaria is not an easy thing. And there was, there was a ton to do. We had, I think we had three cows. We had Dharma and Bumi and Nandini at the time. This was before the dairy. Um, we had cows to take care of. We had, you know, stuff to do and, um, and Vrindaranya decided, so she and I were the only ones there, Skudamraj and Vrindaranya and myself. And then she decided to spend the winter in Palo Alto at her mom's place. And um, I think she was doing a editing course, a copy editing course through the university there. So suddenly I was the only one, Skudamraj and me for a whole winter. And it was just absolutely brutal. Just the amount of like I would make lists and I would forget to look at the lists because I just had stuff to do every day. And like I was, Guru Maharaj would, would, be, would be getting annoyed with me because I was forgetting to do things or, um, you know, I would just so many details to manage, I would inevitably drop some of them. I just couldn't, you know, I just did not have the processing power to, to keep all that stuff straight sometimes. And um, that was very, very difficult winter but somehow managed to stay, you know, not go crazy at the same time. And I think, um, well, that, that period, that was, that was hard for different reasons, you know, just cause it was just insanely busy and, um, trying to, again, man manage so many details. It wasn't like physically super, hard. it was just, just the management of all these details, so many different directions, like all the different services that had to be done. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but there was another period, wh which was there was a there was a fellow there from England, who they were trying to they were trying to uh, because it looked like the mission was expanding and people were coming and they were trying to bring more of a structure to the ashram. And so Vrindaranya was a temple president. This fellow was made the temple commander, and suddenly I was under him, even though I was senior to him by a number of years. And so he didn't, uh, let's just say he wasn't, the, he, he liked, I think he liked having somebody to tell what to do. <laughs> it kind of took a little bit of relevant. Um, he was a good man in a lot of ways, but you know, this period I was struggling for a number of my own internal reasons. And then this external circumstance, I mean, um, <laughs> at that period, uh, Vrindaranya had instituted these, these really strong, um, like schedules to the point where your day was written out for you and like 
to the minute, the 15 minute block. And it was kind of like, it felt extremely oppressive in terms of any kind of autonomy one would have. At least that's how I perceived it at the time. And I understand, you know, what the, what the goal of it was, was to, you know, not be wasting time. But when it's coming from someone else, that feels very, very oppressive. So it was during one of those, during this period, and then um, the temple, this is still built. And so the festival program, so much to do that by the time the festival would come around, I'd be already exhausted. <laughs> and so the last thing I wanted to do was look at a bunch of guests and deal with a bunch of guest needs when my own needs weren't being met. You know, I was already in a state of just exhaustion by the time the festival even started. And then the festivals took it up to a whole other level for a number of days. <laughs> and so that was, the festivals were something that, that unfortunately, a lot of ways I dreaded because they were just so, uh, so difficult in so many ways. Um, they could be awesome too, don't get me wrong, but man, they just like, well, as a staff person rather than as a guest, it's a completely different experience. Um, so, you know, you're essentially on call for a number of days and, and then you're already on call as, as a, as a ashramite, but you know, during a festival, it's just, so anyhow, um, yeah, I was really, really, really struggling during that period. And, and, um, when, by the time the festival came around, I was in a really negative space and, and good merch could see that. And it was to the point where, oh, it was, I think it was Yasa Puja, because at one point we had to go up and he was sitting on his rocking chair out on his deck and he had just given a lecture and we had we'd done kirtan and we were going and offering flowers to eat, offering push punjali. And so I offered mine and when I bowed down, he put his foot on my head because he knew this guy needs a little mercy here. <laughs> And so, you know, and I gratefully accepted it and it, it seemed to help some, but, you know, that was a very, very difficult period. Um, and then, but, you know, I managed to stay, didn't leave, didn't until years later, 2008. Yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, so a lot of, it seems like a lot of struggles with, you know, maybe having too much to do and um, not feeling like you had, yeah, you're, you weren't getting your own needs taken care of all the time and just overstretching, which is common experience that devotees who have lived in ashrams can share. So I would like to hear, since we're getting quite, kind of, you know, near our end of the time, I would like to hear how what advice that you would have to give, um, yeah, devotees maybe who, um, I mean, there aren't very many ashram opportunities anymore, but for someone that maybe mm -hmm. wanted that kind of an opportunity, I mean, there's still Madhavan, um, mm -hmm. maybe what kind of advice would you have that would, you know, that you would give to someone that was going into that kind of a situation to help them, what would your, what kind of advice would you have? Um, I would say, well, the first thing you got to know really well and what your, where your limits are. And that's difficult because you often don't know where your limits are until you try, until you're pushed. So there's that. Um, but I would say that, you know, once you know, let's say you've been put in situations and you know kind of where your limits are and um, where your comfort zone lies. And so, okay, being 1% or 5% outside comfort zone is one thing, being 20% out outside it is something else. And then being 1% or 5% outside it for a week is and the same for completely different. So like, I would say on a, just a really practical level, you really need to A, know yourself, know what your limits are and what you can and cannot do and um, communicate clearly your boundaries. You know, like 
this is what I can do. This is what I cannot do. If I'm asked to do more than this, then it won't be bad. It will, will not be good for me or anybody else. Um, now, of course, unfortunately, a lot of times in ashrams, there's a sort of a culture where that sort of thing is not, maybe it's not spoken, but it's sort of this unspoken taboo to do such a thing that you don't, you don't make demands on the ashram, you just do whatever is asked of you, you know. But Gunaraj has said many times and, um, that, you know, he didn't really want to put people in that position. But some, all times it ended up like that. But, you know, he, he wanted people to know where their boundaries were at so that they could tell him and be like, you know, uh, and in a, in a, express it in a way like I mentioned earlier, like, okay, so you're asking me to do this and I've already got all this on my plate. Something's got to give here. So which do you want it to be? In other words, you know, like I'm willing, but there's only so much I can do realistically. Yeah. Um, so to couch it in those terms, then that makes it much um, that's that's a realistic way of going about it, you know, and um, you know, and, and understanding that the guru wants us to do things, but he also wants us to make spiritual progress. And so, you know, getting things done at the cost of our internal life is not what the guru is about, even though it can seem like that sometimes when the demands are super heavy. No, that's great. Thank you. I think that's very helpful advice for everyone. You know, whether you're in an ashram or even in a, in a grahasta ashram, you know, in a family situation, mm -hmm. it can be, there can also be these kind of situations that come up too and learning to be able to communicate. And it's, there is a tendency to push beyond our limits and get to that place of fatigue and then, you know, yeah. and then anger. It needs prevails. to be negotiation. Yeah, yeah, so it's- right. Really, yeah, you really, don't want to go there. You know, that's yeah. that, that's not good. So I think it's, you know. Because, I mean, I, life is hard. Yes, life is hard. And, and you, you and use life the. Life is hard and it will push your buttons. Yeah. And you were saying something about the notes on the pillows. I can only imagine that means devotees who said goodbye. I'm, I've left. Thanks for your. And, and they're gone. That kind really, of thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so that, yeah, you don't want that to happen. And um, I certainly saw a lot of that in my ashram years um, in ISKCON that, sure. yeah, we would just see people gone, you know, <laughs> be like, what happened to Bhakti so-and-so or Bhakti and so-and-so or this person? And you'd see all their mm -hmm. stuff was gone, you know? And it was like, I mean, we didn't even get a note on the pillow. So note on the pillow was a step <laughs> up. Yeah, they just disappeared, yeah. Yeah, I'm just gone. Yeah, um, there's, there's a lot to be said about, you know, all the psychological ramifications of that discontinuity and people coming and going into your life and whatnot, and not wanting to get close to new people because you think they're going to be gone, you know, sooner rather than later. And, you know, that's, there's a lot, there's a lot of sacrifices that are made in ashram life, you know, that are both overt and subtle that people don't have any idea about until they actually do it. Yeah, yeah. And what would you say is the most striking, profound change in yourself that you've seen as a result of having traversed this path for as long as you have? Hmm. Well, I think there would probably be a couple answers to that. Um, the first would be just the overall philosophical shift from a Ramasayuji orientation to Bhakti. That's in one lifetime that's huge that's huge um, and so that's that's a huge upgrade um but then within the path of bhakti itself um i would say um i don't take myself as seriously as i used to and um life has humbled me in a lot of ways and that has been all to the good like a mm -hmm. I've, I've been softened by life and as a result, I have a lot more feeling for bhakti now than I did, even though maybe earlier I would have a, a strong 
practice ethic, but that would sometimes come at the cost of my humanity. So um, I have a broader view of the thing now and what's really essential and what's really important. And um, that I think is a pretty big shift. Wow, that's tremendous. And that's what we want. We want, you know, <clears throat> we want our hearts to become soft. And, and like yeah. you said, that's like all these, you know, life. You, what did you say? You said uh, the things that happen in life. Yeah, that's the messiness that Krishna orchestrates to make, <laughs> to put us through. And that, sure. yeah, and, and it, you know, the ashram life. And then you had some, some ashram, you also had some grahasta experiences that also I'm sure have shaped a lot of your current thinking about who you are and what you what's important to you and oh absolutely yeah <laughs> so yeah. yeah i mean pursuing one's desires you know um there are, for, for every lifestyle there are costs <laughs> and benefits and um you know getting older the benefit of getting older is that you have perspective you can reflect back and look at health and situations before and and think about them differently and think about how you really want to live your life um, you know how do you really want to spend your time how do i want my days to be structured you know it's like each day could be my last how am i going to spend this day mm. um i meditate on death a lot because it's not that far away for any of us really when you look at it philosophically so that being the case then all right um it really is in my interest too um and i'm not saying i don't have my distractions i still do but um they're becoming less and less by the power of bhakti nice you know you start to see it it's real you know more and more i always i was a fairly detached kind of person always and that could be to the detriment of my practice or to the detriment of my bhakti understanding of bhakti like kind of a gyan samskar I had, which mm. <clears throat> can be a little bit, you know, cold and just harsh sometimes. Um, and I think uh, I've, I think by the grace of Bhakti Devi and devotees and Harinam, uh, that's uh, not so much a thing anymore for me. Wow. Those are, are wonderful um, changes I've seen in yourself over the years. Um, and of course, we know you continue on this path. If I, if we have this another interview in ten years, we're going to hear even you know more ex wonderful things and different changes. Because yeah, I always like the way you know Gumaraj talks about getting you know like Nishta, it's like the top of the mountain, and then from there you just kind of roll down the other side. So I'm looking right. forward to the just rolling down the other side part. <laughs> dance down dance down the mountain into the valley of love yeah, yeah. so um i would like to um open this up for questions um see if anyone has anything they would like oh sakirati has her hand up she's i hope you were able to hear i see that you had said you were having trouble hearing it's it's uh, shamananda who has the question oh shamananda okay <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. I can't tell whose hand it is. <laughs> oh, <of course. laughs> okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so I wanted to ask you, Chitta Hari, uh, about um, like uh, uh, people have asked you before, but I can't find the text anywhere. But about the um, the story of finding the the, the Govardhan Shilas that, that are at Madhuvan. Oh, okay. Um... So 1998, I was with Guru Maharaj and Vrindavan, and I don't remember exactly what month it was, but um, it was sometime during the trip, it was before the hot season really started kicking in, but the mornings were getting hot. Um, by like 11, you didn't really want to be walking outside, it was getting kind of hot. And so one day Guru Maharaj decided he wanted to go to Govardhan, he wanted to get Govardhan Shilas. So we got in the car and we went and we got there probably about you know, 10 or 11 and 
you know how you're not supposed to walk on Govardhan with shoes on. And so we're barefoot. And so we, um, he was looking for Krishna Balaram Shilas, of course. And so we got there and within maybe 15 minutes or so, Baladev revealed himself. And so we got Baladev, now we got to find Krishna. And that's when it started getting hot. So Baladev, you know, the guru, he's merciful. He reveals himself a little more easily. You know, we didn't have to undergo a whole lot of austerity before he appeared. And then Krishna waited a while to reveal himself. And it started getting hot and the sand was burning our feet and whatnot. And finally, you know, Krishna was like, okay, here I am. And so then we took them back to the house that we were renting in Vrindavan. And uh, Gurmar said, okay, so these, these they've been baking up for 5,000 years. Give them a bath clean them up and then get them set up on the altar. And I said, so do we need to install them? He said, no, this is Govardhan Sheila. No need for that. They're, they're direct manifestations of Krishna. It's like, okay. So Vrindaranya bathed Baladev, I bathed Krishna. And then, um, and then uh, I think I, I painted them. Oh no, I didn't paint them yet. Cause we still had to go. We went that night to Loi Bazaar to get their eyes and crowns and uh, skirts and things and then yeah then i started worshiping them on the altar along with i think i was doing giraj puja every day and then krishna Balram once a week or something i forget exactly how it was um so yeah i was privileged to be the first one to put their faces on them and whatnot they were merciful to me <laughs> jai thank you thank you jai. um do we have any other questions anybody from this from the Spanish side, Akura, anybody? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Anything, any last words, uh, concluding words, Chitta, that you might want to um, leave us with, or you feel like you've Covered what um, you wanted to say. <clears throat> yeah, one. Of, I think. Well, one of your questions was, um, "What do you think? What what insights would you share from what you've learned?" I guess uh, something like to that effect. I would say, um, it's really important and incumbent upon a sadhaka to. Try to be a saragrahi. Find the essence of the thing and gravitate toward that. And those would be like the non-negotiable elements of your practice, like chanting Harinam, hearing and chanting, right? That's the basics, but they're the basics for a reason. Like a master is a master because he or she is a master at the basics. And so these, these things that we've heard emphasized, they're emphasized for a reason. And to really get that into your head, like... You know, the rules are there to support the practice, but ultimately it's Harinam and hearing about the Leela that's going to take you there. And that's how you develop a, a feeling for the thing, right? So as important as those rules and whatnot are, I would say, you know, like we're not, this is not a path of rules. And so trying to understand what that is, trying to get a feeling for that and um, cultivate that feeling. Um, when I was just in, in Raleigh with Guru Maharaj um, after the program, um, Supal and Hamantra and myself went on a walk with him. With his children, but he was kind of more tuned into them, um, understandably. Um, and I asked Guru Maharaj about um because i had been reading something about the saints of brudge and how their their uh they would often express that they didn't feel that their budget was successful if they didn't have darshan of krishna <laughs> so i was like well so you know how does that square with what you've often said Guramaj, that we sh you know we're not trying to see krishna we're just trying to serve him and his explanation was 
that, that evolved into a, a discussion of, of, of longing. He like said, so in Bhava Bhakti, there's the longing there where sadhana, the sadhaka is more centered around surrender and um, whatnot. So he said, but even in the state of sadhana, it's not that there's no longing there. It's there. It's just not the main element. And, and, and in fact, the longing, the desire to achieve Vraj Bhakti is the thing that fuels the practice in reality. So without that, you're just kind of going through the motions, right? So I would say whatever little desire we have, that's the spark that we want to fan. And the rules and whatnot are only there in as much as they support that. Because ultimately, the rules and the Shastra come from God himself. They're, they're, the power derives from God. And so if uh, the path of Rag Bhakti is about pleasing the person who created the rules in the first place. So if you do that, then the rules are secondary. So um, I'm not by any means, obviously, advocating that we don't follow the rules, but just remembering what they're for. And it's really, it's, it's a heart. It's a, we come to this because we want love. That's what we come here for. And so as Bhakti Vinod says, we should by hook or by crook, beg, borrow, or steal, taste for the name somehow. Mm. And so some feeling for Krishna, some feeling for the moods of, that the Rajavasis have for him. Nice. That's, that's my advice. That's great. Yeah, thank you. And um, really appreciate it. I just, there were a couple comments I want to share in the... Um, that we re really appreciate the interview. That's from Sakirati and Shamananda. And Omkar, many, many wise words, salutation. <laughs> and then there's a um, comment across from uh, Anapurna. You want to read that? I don't know if it's a question. And Chitta, can you repeat the question so they can hear it on the um, on face on the Facebook? Okay. Have I, in the course of talking to Maya bodies, been able to perhaps persuade them or give them doubts about their own path? Um, no, not really. I haven't had much association with um, people who are interested in that. Once I've got involved with devotees i pretty much keep to my, keep to my devotional company as much as possible and um i haven't really met any people who are following that path so i had an opportunity to um, speak to them about bhakti nice okay i guess that looks like we're pretty much out of time and um want to thank you so much chitahari for Coming at the last minute, um, we had a had some mix up with um, Gopal Nandini's interview. She will be doing it in December instead. And next week, um, Govinda Dasi will be um, doing her interview, and Akura will be doing the translation. And um, so it'll be. It won't be simultaneous, it'll be um, back and forth. Um, so we'll try to pin the three of us on the, um, the screen so we can do something a little different. We did do it with our, with um, Vaishnav Maharaj in the beginning, we, uh, we, we did that um, where we did just back and forth translating. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, 
and um, yeah, one happy Kartik to everybody and mm. lots of sweetness of from Radharani coming to all of you because this is her month and we she's very merciful to us. Mm. Next month, Chidahari will be giving some classes on Radharani so we can this the special qualities of Radharani. So we can all look forward to that as well. Mm. Jai, Hare Krishna, dear devotees, Haribo. Hare. Hare. Hare.